Wow, well thanks so much Jimmy, I'm sure we're all warmed up now. Um, if you don't know me, my name's Ed and uh, a really important part of our time together is to open our Bibles and to let God speak to us. Jimmy's already got us started on that. Um, he's a hard act to follow, but stick with us and let's open our ears and our hearts to God. I expect for all of us, we want to be people of integrity. We want to be true to what we believe and act in line with our values. And yet, we live in a world that seems so full of compromise, where so many people seem to have values that are different to our own. You know, we read stories in the news of politicians failing to follow the COVID rules that they set. You know, we hear of leaders, even Christian leaders, being unfaithful in their marriages. We're aware of colleagues exaggerating their expense claims. I heard of a man who wrote to the tax authorities and said this, Dear Sirs, Last year, when I filed my income tax return, I deliberately misrepresented my income. Now I can't sleep. Enclosed is a cheque for £150. If I still can't sleep, I'll send the rest. It seems like many are happy to settle for almost honesty or just a bit of compromise. Do you ever feel under pressure to compromise on your most important values? I want to be honest, but everyone else is cutting corners on their work. I want to show respect for my boss, but she's incompetent and everyone can't stand her. I want to give my family my undivided attention at the dinner table, but my colleague really needs to speak to me about this important proposal. I want to buy fair trade, but these shoes are so much cooler and they're cheaper. Today, we're starting a new series from the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. And the series is called Stand. And one of the core themes in Daniel is this whole issue of being people of integrity. Being people of integrity in the midst of a challenging, challenging world. How do we take a stand? Over the next five weeks, as you might hope, there's going to be bizarre dreams. There's going to be hungry lions. There's going to be fiery furnaces. And what we'll see running all through is the incredible faithfulness of God demonstrating in the lives of Daniel and his friends. And we'll see that they were people who took a stand with extraordinary courage. But as we begin in chapter one this morning, what we see in Daniel is not only extraordinary courage, but also extraordinary wisdom. Daniel knew how to take a stand in the right way at the right time and for the right reason. You know, if you're a Christian watching this, then, then hear this. We are called to take a stand in this challenging world, but it is possible to do that in the wrong way, at the wrong time, and for the wrong reason. How, when, and why should we take a stand? Daniel is an amazing book, and it was great to see so many of you on Zoom on Monday evening for a, an overview of the whole book. If you missed it, check out the audio recording by visiting highgrove.church daniel. You'll get heaps more out of this series over the next five weeks if you do. So we're reading from Daniel chapter 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years and after that they were to enter the king's service. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, the chief official gave them new names, to Daniel, the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. So here we have a, a double whammy for the Israelites, the people of God. Nebuchadnezzar, probably the most powerful monarch in the world, uh, not only destroys the temple and pinches precious treasures, but he also robs them of their future too by taking all the best and brightest up and coming young leaders. And among those were Daniel and his three friends. They were most likely somewhere between 12 and 15 years old. In other words, they were just teenagers. 
and we read of a three-year period of training, Babylon Boot Camp, which was basically three years of brainwashing. You know, these young men taking a thousand miles away from their home are taught the lingo and get immersed in the Babylonian literature and history and society. You know, a society where God was not followed or honoured. They even had their names changed. Daniel's name becomes much less memorable, whereas his friends get much more entertaining names. Lots of jokes there. Everything is done to separate them from their Jewish roots. Everything is done to ensure that they are so taken up with a new way of life in their new surroundings that they forget about their own home and they forget about their own God. I wonder if that feels familiar to us. You know, as Christians, we know that it's so easy to become so assimilated to everything and everyone around us. And we forget that our, our citizenship, that our God and our values are completely different. And as most of us would do if we were in captivity, it seems like Daniel and his friends are, are just going with the flow. You, you can imagine them shrugging their shoulders and saying, well, we've got no choice. And then suddenly, in verse 8, the story pivots with one little word, but. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. Now God had caused the official to show favour and compassion to Daniel, but the official told Daniel, I am afraid, my lord the king, who has assigned your, your food and drink, why should he see you looking worse than the other men of your age? Daniel then said to the guard, Please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. Now, this is amazing. And not just because it's teenage boys asking to eat vegetables. Daniel doesn't refuse the training of the king or the use of the non-Jewish name, but he draws the line at eating the king's food. I've got to say, as a teenager, I hated language lessons. I, I wasn't very fond of English literature. I also wasn't that keen on being given the name Ed the Duck. You have to be a certain age to know what I'm talking about. But I loved food, so this seems a bit upside down to me. Perhaps it was just on a whim. Perhaps Daniel was just feeling a bit under the weather and had lost his appetite. Or maybe he was just winging it. No, we, we read that Daniel resolved. In other words, he decided in advance, he predetermined, he knew what his values were. And it was a deliberate choice to take a stand when it came to eating the king's food and drinking the king's wine. But why? Some people suggest it was because of Levitical uh, dietary laws even though those same laws permitted wine. Others suggest it's because the food had been offered to idols, but then probably the veggies would have been uh, submitted to idol idols too. I think that he drew the line eating the king's food because it would have been a public declaration of his allegiance and his dependency on the king, rather than his allegiance and his dependency on God. Daniel understood that accepting the king's food was committing himself to the loyalty of King Nebuchadnezzar rather than to God. Daniel didn't kick back against his new name. He, he knew his true identity. He didn't care about his own name, but he did care about God's name. And he didn't want to see God's name dishonoured or insulted. Daniel didn't take a stand about everything that bothered him. He took a stand on the things that mattered most. Deborah reminded me of, of a time when I learned this lesson a few years ago. Um, I'm an accountant, which is just a little bit more exciting than it sounds. Um, I had to do a couple of years of study, including spells, at a training college in advance of taking some exams. You know, the first year I was there, I was really surprised to find that we had to go into college and study on Good Friday one year, just before Easter. And to be honest, it, it got my goat a bit. You know, I thought to myself, don't they know the significance of Good Friday? It's wrong. What, why as a Christian do I have to put my work and my study before God? And I thought, I'm going to kick up a fuss about this. There's a principle at stake. And I remember sounding off to my mentor about it one day and, and telling him that I was, I was thinking about confronting the college about it. I don't remember his exact words to me, but it went something a little bit like this. He said, 
you know, my approach in these kinds of situations is this. If, if taking a stand is just to assert my rights and to benefit me, then I think I'd probably keep quiet. But if it's because others are being discriminated against or others are being unfairly treated, that's when I'd speak up. And I had just enough humility in that moment to realise that it wasn't my love and my care for others or my desire to honour God that got me all riled up about this silly little thing. It was my desire for a lie-in. You know, even as a teenager, Daniel knew what mattered and what didn't. And he exercised incredible wisdom and respect in the way he took a stand. Deborah's going to talk a bit more to us about that next week. But God, in his grace, caused the official to show favour and sympathy in the most miraculous way. And at the end of chapter one, we read that even though they had taken a stand, Daniel and his friends get noticed by the king. Verse 20 says this. In every matter of wisdom and understanding, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in the whole kingdom. And as we shall see as we go through the rest of this series, God raises Daniel and his friends up. Yes, they work hard. They progress their careers. They're successful and they have positions of influence. But they never let this trump their higher allegiance, their loyalty to God. They continue to take a stand about the right things at the right times and in the right ways. Things get a bit hairy to say the least at times. But God shows himself to be incredibly faithful and incredibly good. In the same way as Daniel, we are called to ask ourselves the question, who do we belong to? Where is our primary allegiance? This week, what pressures have you felt to compromise on your most important values? When have you been tempted to forget that your primary allegiance is to God? Is it an overly demanding career, leaving you no time for God or your family? Is it a gossipy friendship group? Is it in the sites that you allow yourself to visit on the internet when you're bored? Is it in the draw of Netflix rather than time with Jesus in Bible reading and in prayer? It might be something else entirely for you. You know, one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to help us to wholeheartedly follow Jesus. He wants to empower us to live for him, to stand out in this world. So we're going to take a chance to pray and I want to encourage you to perhaps just to hold your hands out to receive from the Holy Spirit. We're just going to take a moment to pause, to wait. Ask to be filled with power. Let's pray. God, thank you that you know us. Thank you that you're aware of the particular pressures we're under to compromise on our faith, on our values and on our priorities. In this world where it seems so hard to be people of integrity and wholehearted commitment to you, please help us as we resolve to take a stand about the right things. Help us as we take a stand about the right things in the right times and in the right ways. Fill us afresh this week. Thank you for the example of Daniel and his friends and for the encouragement we find in reading of your faithfulness to them throughout Daniel. Please help us as we, we journey through this book together over these next few weeks. Help us to listen to you and help us to be challenged to stand out for you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And please uh, join us as we respond to God further in worship now.